Julie. <laughs> I knew it felt kind of cool up here. <laughs> Great to have you at this time, if we will, if y'all will stand with me as we sing Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about His groaning, of His precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me. Great to have y'all tonight. If y'all will continue to sing with me. Only trust him.
Come every soul by sin oppressed There's mercy with the Lord And He will surely give you rest By trusting in His Word Only trust Him, only trust Him Only trust Him Yeah. 
Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we come to you this evening singing praises to you, Lord, because you're worthy to be praised. Lord, I just ask that you continue to bless this service, fill this room, Lord, as we hear from your word. Be with Brother Lane as he brings the message, Lord. May it speak to our lives. May we go out stronger than ever to do your will, to tell others about you. Lord, be with the ones that are traveling. Give them traveling grace, Lord. Be with, the, be with the lost, be with the sick, and be with the unborn, Lord. Place your hands of healing and comfort over them. Lord, just forgive us for where we fail you, and I pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you, Tyler. Well, one of the classic questions that is always raised against Christians is why do the righteous suffer? And I guess that would be a question all of us have asked at some point in time in our lives when we see people who are serving the Lord go through great hardship. And that's not something that should shock us. We can find page after page of Scripture of some of God's choicest servants that have suffered greatly. But when we see someone serving and making a great impact for kingdom's sake, and we see them going through that, we kind of scratch our heads and go, Lord, that's not the way it's really supposed to be. But yet, Scripture tells us that many times that is exactly what happens to some of God's choice servants. And from time to time, we hear the dramatic rescues of when the body of Christ comes together and we pray and we want to see somebody healed and God take that cancer away from them, uh, heal them from this sickness or uh, God repair this problem. And then when he does, we rejoice in that. But the reality is we know that odds are that person may not make it. Uh, that person didn't find themselves cured of cancer. Uh, we know these old, these old bodies are going to wear out one day. Uh, many of you have already buried loved ones. And you said, wait, no, wait a minute, Lord, that's not what I was praying for. And it didn't turn out the way I had wanted it to. So-called Christian TV today, and be cautious of that, of course. If you watch enough of that, you will hear statements like well if you're really in the know if you're really growing in the Lord and you're really serving him and you're really doing what you're supposed to be doing you will always have health and wealth and prosperity and life will be just wonderful and the only problem with that is it's not in this book but they'll say the the, the mark of real blessings from God is for all that to be happening in your life. And if it's not happening, basically one of two things is not happening in your life. Number one, you don't have enough faith, or two, you're living in sin. Only problem with that as well is it's not in the Bible. But you hear that all the time. And so the lost sees all that, and they, and they look at all the people with problems, and they say, well, this doesn't match up. And it obviously doesn't. I gave you an outline tonight to kind of help you save some time on trying to write some of this down. And uh, we'll uh, allow you to make any notes in addition to that. But I wanted you to hang on to this tonight. And because you may need this tomorrow when somebody calls you and asks you a question about something. Or six months from now or 12 months from now. You can really boil down all of the four gospels that our Lord said by basically three things. Number one, the world's going to hate you. Now, we don't like that. We like to be liked. You don't wake up tomorrow and go, I hope somebody hates me today. No, you don't do that. 
But the Word of God says if you follow Him, if you serve Him, the world's not going to think you're the greatest guy around or the greatest gal around because you're going to run contrary to what the world wants. He also says you're never going to be alone. You know, that's what he kept telling his disciples, getting them ready, getting them ready, getting them ready. I'm leaving, guys. I'm leaving, guys. But I'm going to send the helper after I'm gone. And it's actually going to be better after I'm gone because rather than me being right beside you, I'm going to be in you, in the person of the Holy Spirit. And the third thing he promised them was, because of that, you will always have an inner peace in spite of what may be happening to you. That you can easily look around and see the world has none of that. They're in mass chaos right now at every turn. There's no inner peace. You can basically sum up the Lord's ministry of the, the principles of what he was teaching them in those three things. And everything else is kind of derivatives out of that. It's peace in the midst of the storm. It's peace in spite of the storm. He promises that you will have inner peace. And when it apparently seems like God has not come through for us, it is at that time that we can have a reserve tank, if you will, to draw from, from some of these things we're going to talk about. Uh, you can look through the pages of Scripture and find a person after person after person where it looks like God did not come through. What about Daniel? God didn't take him out of the lion's den. He let him be thrown into the lion's den. He preserved him while he was there, didn't he? What about Paul's life? Historians tell us that Paul was beheaded in Rome. He said, no, 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 no. That's not how Paul's life should have ended. That's, that's, I mean, my goodness, this is outside of Jesus Christ, probably the greatest follower of Christ that we've ever seen. T to end his life like that? No, no, no. That's not how I would have written the script. And it looks like God didn't come through for the apostle John who was left to die an old man on the island of Patmos. And obviously it looks like from a casual observation that God didn't come through for his own son either, did he? He left him to die on that cross. So see, when we look at things, it looks like, wait a minute, God, that's not how I would have wrote the script. Father didn't rescue any of them. So let me give you these seven things to remember tonight to fall back on when God appears to have not come through for you. Number one, remember the proven dependability of his love. Sometimes you and I just need to focus on all the other times that he has come through for us. And usually those are far more often than the times that it looks like he didn't come through for us. Take your Bible, turn to Philippians uh, chapter 4. You know this passage very well. Probably got it underlined in your Bible. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Think on the good stuff. What does the psalmist say? For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What you think about is what you're going to become. Sometimes when it seems like your prayers are bouncing like a bad check, instead of bailing out on the Lord, go back and remember those good and faithful times and just praise the Lord for the things in the past that he's already done. And usually that'll be enough to get you through. Number two, remember the sufficiency of his grace. You know this passage well, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who would not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, that you may be able to endure it. Now let's talk about the sufficiency of his grace for just a moment. Three thoughts there, you have them in your notes. First of all, don't feel like a lone ranger. So my life looks pretty good right now, it looks like everything's going along. Just hang on, your time's coming. Eventually, it gets around to everybody for the rocky road, the choppy water, the difficulty of life. Everybody goes through this. Everybody faces some kind of trials and testings. When you look at everybody else, it looks like everybody's got trouble but you. Just hang on. Your day is coming. 
Number two, he says he will not allow you to be tested beyond what you're able. Now, we've heard that and probably believe that for all of our time as a follower of Christ. I suppose on a scale of 1 to 10,000, God knows what the breaking point would be that you would recant the Lord, deny the Lord, reject Christ. And that breaking point may be 8,360. Well, he may take you up to 8,359, but if he knows that's where your breaking point is, he will never push you past that point to where you would embarrass the Lord, recant the Lord. He knows we are of dust. He knows our feet are of clay. He knows we are fallen creatures, that he has remade us, has re, re, rebuilt us with a new nature. He knows we have, we have fleshly bodies that are prone to falling third thought here is it's a, a, an unfortunate translation the word escape that's always bothered me that doesn't mean there's an error in scripture it just means that sometimes when things are translated from the Greek or Hebrew into English that sometimes that word just doesn't do it justice the word escape in this passage can create an interesting if not confusing image for us uh, NIV says a way out some other translations may have some different ways of phrasing that but you know as well as I do that does not mean you get out of but if you say well did you hear about the Smiths they escaped the house fire and you you and I would know exactly what that meant that means they got out before the fire got bad they escaped it they dodged it they avoided it but you know as well as I do that's not how life happens you have to go through things in life you don't get a way out all the time the promise is not that you will not go through some Red Sea experience, some dark day. The problem is that the victory is on the other side of the Red Sea. You've got to go through the Red Sea. If the children of Israel had stood on the Red Sea and just said, you know, we're not moving, God, until you fix all these things, and then we'll think about walking over. That's not what happened, was it? They had to step out, and then the waters parted. And they walk through the whole time. I'm sure thinking, looking up on either side, oh my goodness, if this thing collapses, we're gone. Of course, you know it did, but after they were already through, the victory was on the other side. Remember the sufficiency of his grace. Number three, remember the re revelation of his purpose. Remember the revelation of his purpose. Now, you're going to like this one. I'm going to spend a little more time on number three than the rest of them because I want you to see what this is. God has clearly revealed in his word what his purpose is. God is up to something in your life. God allows through his perfect will everything that comes into your life to have a purpose. Nothing happens to a Christian by accident. Did you hear that? There are not many purposes that God is up to in your life. He is up to a purpose in your life, and that is to make you look like Christ. Now, how he gets there, well, there are people in this room right now. But he's not up to 14 different things in your life. He's up to one thing in your life, and that's to make you look like Christ until he takes you home to heaven. Romans 8. You know this passage, probably one of the first things you ever memorized. Romans 8. 28 and 29. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. That's his purpose for every one of you, is to get you to look like Jesus. Now let me give you just a little bit of lame theology here, and I'll think, I don't think I'm off base. I believe within the Godhead of the Trinity that the Father was so taken with absolute, pure, undefiled love for the Son, Jesus Christ, that he created a process that the world would be filled with beings very much like his Son. So God could lavish all the love upon all of us. And so God created a man. We know him in Scripture as Adam. He was made, Scripture says, in the image of God. Now remember, I, I think the Father was so taken with absolute, 
un, unfathomable love for the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. And he said, I'm going to create a system where I can lavish all my love on beings all over a planet. And so he made a man named Adam. Jesus, Scripture says, was the express image of the living God. Adam must have been very, very similar in many ways to the Lord Jesus Christ, yet not God, but only a man. But we know sin entered the picture, and God was not going to let Satan have the last word, so God stepped into time and history and sent Jesus Christ to this world as a little small baby to then grow up to live a perfect sinless life to go to a cruel real Roman cross to pay for the sins of the world and what sin did with Adam and Eve the serpent had done all that God said I'm gonna remake man and so you and I are now not made in the image of God anymore only one person was ever made in the image of God we are now made in the image of sinful Adam we come into this world with a sin nature a bent away from God only one man was ever made perfectly in the image of God that was Adam he was sinless until he and Eve sinned and now every baby born as precious as they are, are born with a sin nature. Any of you ever had to send your kids to disobedient school? They do that real good, don't they? In fact, you've got to bend them back toward obedience, don't you? You can take that little sweet little baby in the nursery, and what does he do? All the toys are mine. He wants everything because that flesh drives him. He is selfish. That has to be bent back toward God. And so you and I have to be remade into the image of God. And when you come to Christ, you are justified. You're now made right. And you're now going through a sanctification process. A sanctifying, a setting apart until you are one day glorified with a new body in heaven. And so all the while there will be millions and millions of glorified beings for God to lavish his love on for all eternity. So how that sanctification process has worked out into our lives. How am I going to be made more and more like him? Uh, hold your place there and look at a passage tucked away in James. You probably know this well. James chapter 1. Verse 2, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. What is a trial? It's something, in many cases, you just have to go through. Sometimes trials don't have a, a real meaning. It's just something God allows to come into your life to see how you're going to react, to see if this makes you more like Christ. Let's say you have a uh, financial need. Let's say you have a need for $50,000. You go down to the bank. Banker says, oh, absolutely. Come in, we'll fill out the paperwork. You're in great shape. End of the day, you don't have a trial anymore. You got your money. You walk into the bank, the banker says, get out of here, I wouldn't loan you a dime. You got a trial. What are you going to do? You've got to go through that. Who knows how long they may last? They may last a short time, they may last a long time. The trying of our faith works patience and perseverance and that brings maturity. So obviously through the heat of trials, God brings about the revelation of of his purpose to mature his people. That is why we shouldn't be surprised when trials come. We ought to be surprised when they don't come. Because that's just showing more evidence that God is trying to perfect us and make us more like Christ. I believe at the moment of our conversion, God looks at all of us and in, in us he sees Christ. He's placed Christ in our life. We have come to be a new creature. However old we were, may have been a, a six-year-old boy or girl, may have been a 36-year-old boy or girl. Whatever age we were, God goes to work on us to make us more like Christ. He, he, like any sculptor, he looks at that huge block of granite, and inside that granite, he sees the finished product, and he begins to chip away. Centuries ago, when Michelangelo carved out his renowned statue of King David, they asked him, well, how did you know how to make it like King David? He said, it was easy. I just chipped where everything didn't look like David. Simple 
ridiculous answer, but a true statement. He just took away everything that did not look like the finished product. And so the father takes out the hammer of adversity and the chisel of difficulty, and he puts you and I in the hotbed, and he goes to work on us, hammering away, chiseling away. This is another little bit of lame theology. I don't have any proof in this, but I think when we come to know Christ, God, and as we begin to grow in age and mature, he goes to work on probably the most unchristlike things in our life first. And when we get those tackled, he then puts away the heavy jackhammer, and then he takes out some more refined tools. And when that victory is reached, he moves on to the next one. In spite of what is happening in my life, I should be praising him and rejoicing that he is conforming me to his image because he loves me enough to not leave me in the state that I was in, but that he wants me to look like Christ. It's that process of purifying refined metals, gold, silver. When they put all that raw product into a big vat and they turn the fire up, what happens? The impurities, the trash, rise to the top. The, 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 the pure metal, the gold, the silver is heavier and it sinks to the bottom. The dross, as they call it, rises to the top and they skim off that top layer. And when that refiner can look down into it, and what's he looking for? A reflection of his face. He knows he can turn the heat down because he's got it like he needs it. Remember the revelation of his purpose. Number four, remember the delight of his person. Just learn to rejoice in who he is rather than what he is currently doing. It's easy to rejoice when the Lord's doing great things. Oh, I had a great day at church today. Oh, we had a great summer. Had a great VBS. Had a great camp. We did. Had a great revival. But what about when it may not be going good? Remember one day the disciples went out into the city. They cast out a few demons raised a few folks from the dead, healed a handful of people, and they came back, could not wait to come back and report to the Lord what had happened to them as they'd been out doing a day of ministry. And rather than celebrating with him, he chastised them a little bit. Remember what he said? He said, he said do not rejoice because the demons are subject to you, but rather that your name is written where? In the Lamb's book of life. Talk about popping the balloon. And they were on cloud nine. Man, they, everything they touched was doing this, acting just like they needed to. Here's what the Lord knew. There's going to come a day when you're going to say, come out. They're not coming out. There's going to come a day when you say, get up and walk. They may not get up and walk. And he knew the one constant that's never going to change in your life is your relationship to me. You're going to have some bad days. You're going to have some rough days. Don't live on the mountaintops. Now, that's easy to do that. We can all do that. But sometimes you're going to have to live in the valley. And the one thing, guys, he's saying to his disciples is never going to change is your relationship to me. Remember not too long after that, exactly the same thing happened. I think it was Matthew chapter 17. Right after the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up, and uh, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, they had a conversation with them, and they come back down off the mountain, and there is a man on his knees before the Lord saying, the other nine that didn't go, they tried to heal the son, and they couldn't do it. And he's now begging Jesus to heal his son. So apparently, they had tried to do that, and it was not, a, not going well. Number five. Remember the mystery of his ways. Remember the mystery of his ways. Don't ever interpret God by the acts of God, but rather the ways of God. That's so easy to do today. To Moses, God revealed his ways. Israel only saw his acts. But God let Moses in on what was really going on. Moses saw what God was up to. The children of Israel only saw what God was doing. It was an act of God to put Paul in prison a few times. A long-time friend of mine, he's long been with the Lord now, full-time evangelist, had a great impact on my early years of ministry, evangelist Mike Gilchrist. He had a statement he used to say, Paul was a runner. I mean, not literally like a, like a jogger, a runner. 
But Paul would go from city to city to town to town to city to town, constantly moving. And God would have to throw him in prison every now and then to get half the New Testament written. Because when Paul would run, he wouldn't write. And when Paul couldn't run, he would write. Most of what you got of these epistles were written from where? A jail cell. It was God's way to make sure parts of that New Testament was going to be written. It was an act of God to put Christ on the cross. But it was the way of God to bring about redemption for all mankind. It was an act of God to put John on Patmos to die alone. But it was God's way to give us the book of Revelation. We would have never seen in chapter 1 of Revelation that what that glorified image of Christ looks like with the long flowing robes and the hair as white as wool, eyes as a flame of fire. And that's not what the world wants today. The world wants that Jesus that was meek and mild and came into Jerusalem that final week before Passion Week on the back of a donkey. That's, 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 that's the mild, meek Christ that the world wants. The Christ they're going to get in judgment is the one we see in Revelation chapter 1. Two different things. God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. Back during the Second World War, people were saying, why does God even let a, a person like Adolf Hitler even exist? Well, it was God's way to raise up America and Great Britain and the Allied forces. God's acts and God's, God's ways are never the same thing. So don't try to interpret what God is up to by simply what God is doing. Number six, remember the promise of his tomorrow. Remember the promise of his tomorrow. Hebrews chapter 11, you know that, of course, is that uh, chapter listed with all of the great warriors of faith. Hebrews eleven thirteen. all these died in faith without receiving the promises but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth and then look at the last two verses of that chapter 39 and 40 and all these having gained approval through their faith did not receive what was promised but got because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us they should not be made perfect. In other words, it took those of us to see the promise to make their faith complete. God promised it to them, but it didn't happen in their lifetime. We now have seen what God was going to do in the ages past their life. Remember that whatever God has promised to do, it might not be on your timetable or my timetable. Uh, we don't like that. Because when we pray about something, we expect God to act. But he doesn't, does he? been praying for that wayward grandson that wayward granddaughter keep praying it may be that brother nathan's going to preside over your funeral before you ever see that are you willing to do that are you willing to be faithful romans eight twenty eight does not say when they will work together for his purpose just that they will there's not a timetable in romans eight twenty eight and 29 are you willing to allow them to lower you down into the casket Still believing, God, you're going to do what I've been praying about, just not on my timetable. Seventh and finally, remember the sweetness of his presence. Remember the sweetness of his presence. All the saints of ages past have testified that very likely the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ was sweeter in the midst of the trials and the struggles and the heartaches. Many of you could probably testify to that. Some of the closest times you've ever had with the Lord were when things were as bleak and as dark and as painful in your life as they could possibly be. Looking back on it, you wouldn't give a plug nickel to be back in the middle of it again. But now looking back on it, you see how much you grew and mature and were strengthened as a believer and probably were able to be a blessing to somebody else. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were thrown into the fiery furnace. I don't think anybody would be standing in line to have that happen to them. Daniel chapter 3 records that for us. Remember, King Nebuchadnezzar was so livid at them, he said, turn the fire seven times up hotter than it's supposed to be and throw them in. 
and said the fire was so hot, the men who were carrying them bound, they got burned up too, just getting them close enough to throw them in. That's pretty hot. And then after they were in there, here comes the king back and he's looking in there and said, how many guys did you people throw in? They said, three. Well, I see four in there and they're just walking around and one like unto the son of the gods. Not only did nothing happen to them, all the binding that they were on had fallen off and they're just walking around and they're praising the Lord, having a great time. And when he had them pulled out, they didn't even as much as smell like smoke. Isn't that just like God to do that? Now, again, I don't think anybody would want to go through anything like that. But it did happen. And think, and, and, the, and, the, and the last part of chapter 3 of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar is falling on his face, just like we talked about today. He knew who he was in the presence of. This, these three guys, gods, are more superior to anything we've got. Whatever they say do, we're going to do. Remember David as he was writing the 23rd Psalm, the first part of the Psalm, he's talking about God. He makes me to lie down. He leads me. He guides me and on and on. And the last part of chapter 23, he's now talking, he's not talking about God. He's talking to God. He makes me, as he gets the, close to that shadow of death, storm clouds gather in his life. And then the pronouns change. Thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. David is now not talking about the Lord. He's talking to God. The Lord realizing the sweetness of his presence. The suffering that David had gone through brought him closer to the Lord. Let me leave you with this story. Dr. Frank Pollard, longtime pastor at First Baptist Jackson, Mississippi, tells this story. His uh, daughter went off to college. We're about to send a bunch of young folk off to college for a new fall semester here in the next few days. She was going to a school up in the northeast part of the country. She was in her freshman semester. She liked to study at the library. It was not a bad walk from her dorm room to the library. She'd walked it so many times she knew exactly how long it would take. Problem was she'd get in the library, she'd start talking to friends and studying together and working on projects and time would get away from her and she would not be back in the dorm before curfew on the weeknights. She had already been written up by the dorm mother twice. Third write-up would have called the parents and things just would not have gone good as the incoming freshman. So she realized time was getting away. Curfew on weeknights was 11 p.m., and she looked at the clock and she said, oh no, I know how long it's going to take me to make it. I'm probably going to get written up again. But she knew that there was a cut through she could use. It would knock off probably five minutes of walking time. It took about 12, 13 minutes normally to walk that journey from the library back to the dorm. But it was late at night now. Obviously, the, it was called the garden area. Uh, it was a, normally an area fine for the daytime there was a lot of a lot of lush greenery a lot of park benches along the way but at night they just didn't expect anybody to be using it and so it was not well lit but it was a pretty good moonlit night and she said i i can't get written up a third time i've got to i've got to just cut through the garden area it'll it'll get me to the dorm in time she stood by the entrance going in and she said, oh, Lord, it's dark. Uh, this, is, this doesn't look good. She just breathed a prayer. And she said, Lord, would you just take care of me? I'm by myself. I've got to get home. Lord, would you take care of me? And off she went. About halfway through, she heard a little rustle over in the bushes. And she glanced over. And like I mentioned, it was a fairly good moonlit night. And the way she could see, she made eye contact with a not a pleasant looking individual over in the bushes and she just sort of kept glancing over there and she said I know we made eye contact but I kept on walking like I hadn't seen him and nothing happened she walked on through she made it back and got back to her dorm in time before 11 p.m. the next morning the dorm mother came across the intercom and said were there any ladies that came through the garden area somewhere between 10 and 11 p.m.? And she immediately knew, well, that, I'm, that, was, that was me. She said, would you come to the 
lobby as soon as you can. And so she got a robe and got her slippers on when she went down to the lobby. And there were two other girls there as well. And there were two detectives from the police department. Unfortunately, there had been an assault that night on the campus. They already had a suspect in custody, and they wanted to know if any women had gone through the garden area between that time period when the alleged assault had taken place. And she said, yes, I did. I came through there just right before 11 o'clock. They said, Janet, would you, uh, would you come to the police station with us? We already have someone in custody that we feel, feel confidently that he's probably our guy. And she said, let me go call my parents, and then I'll be able to come with you. She went back to her dorm, got dressed, called her, called her mom, and she said, that I'm going to go to the police station. They're going to get me back. I'll call you when I get back to the room. They took her down there. You've watched enough police shows. You know how that is. They paraded a bunch of guys through there through a one-way mirror, and they walked in. She's in anonymity back there. They can't see who she is. She said, that's him right there. I know I'd recognize him anywhere. We looked at each other last night. Well, he had already said, I was in the area, but I didn't do anything. And she says, thank you very much, ma'am. Would you sign an affidavit saying that you have identified this man and this officer right here will take you back to the camp? And she said, I want to talk to him. I said, ma'am, we don't recommend that for your protection. We've got you behind this one-way glass. She said, I don't care. He's already seen me. He knows I've seen him. I want to talk to him. She was insistent. She wouldn't, she wouldn't take no for an answer. One of the detectives said, make the arrangements. Let's set up a room. We'll come in there with her. We handcuff the guy, sit him in the chair. So that's what happened. She walks in. She immediately goes right up to him, shakes a finger. She says, I saw you last night. He got irate and said, I've already told him I was there, but I didn't do anything. She says, I just got one question for you, sir. I saw you and you saw me. I want to know why her and not me. He started to laugh at her and said, lady, are you crazy? What with you and that big guy that was walking right next to you? Now you can believe whatever you want to believe of that. She had no idea anything was going on. But whatever that guy saw or thought he saw, there was another guy a, a, or a guy walking with her through that garden. I find it interesting that all through the pages of Scripture... Every time God allowed one of his angels to leave the supernatural, to leave the spirit world and step into time and history and the physical world, and we see that throughout scripture, they always took the form of a male. I have no assumption to make a point of that. It's just that that's just what scripture says. Who knows? God may have immediately heard that prayer, summoned an angel, said, walk her through the garden. And it happened. Who knows? She would have never known that. There's no telling what the Lord has done for you that you will never know because you never saw anything. But he answered a prayer for you when you said, God, would you do this? Would you do that? Would you make sure she gets there? Would you make sure he gets home? That God answered that prayer. Sometimes the sweetness of his presence is the greatest thing we can have, even when we sometimes don't know he's even there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for blessing us in times when we, we don't even have an idea that we're being blessed. Father, we don't deserve any of it. We ask you to continue to work in our hearts, cleanse us, purify us, allow us to be grateful and blessed and acknowledge your presence in all that we can do and say. And we'll give you the praise for that. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Tyler, come and just uh, play a quick verse for us. You just thank the Lord, talk to him, allow him just to continue to work in your heart and life today maybe you hadn't thanked him lately for something he's done for you as one of those principles were just thanking for the good th good times the good things and when he has come through for you as philippians 4 8 says think on these things would you stand as tyler leads us you talk to the lord 
Just as I am Without one plea But that thy blood Was shed for me And that thou bidst me Come to Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot of Thank y'all for being here. It's just a great honor to have Brother Lane here. Let's give him a round of applause. And remember, this Wednesday at 6, he'll be with us, correct? No? No? Okay. Okay. I, I'm, okay, I'm sorry. Brother Nathan will be back. <laughs> but thank you so much for being here. And uh, Mr. Tommy Glenn, if you would dismiss us in prayer.